everyone. Um, I realize that there are people on the call from different countries and that for some of you it is very early in the morning so good morning to you and uh, just in case there are some callers uh, in a different time zone which is much later in the day good evening to you and good afternoon for everybody else. Thank you so much for joining me on the call today and I'm going to be talking to you about, about what effective change managers know and do. I'll start by giving you a very uh, brief uh, background to um, you know what I've been up to and, um, and then start with talking about the difference between project management and change management. Now, why is it important for us to be focusing on change management? And what is it exactly that change managers do? because it's a very wide-ranging role, um, and what is it useful for them to know to be an effective change manager, which will lead me on to talk about the new change management body of knowledge. I'll explain what it is and how it can be helpful to you. Now, you've probably noticed that I'm using the term change manager quite a lot, and I recognize that not everybody is going to be called a change manager who actually is involved in managing change. So, um, very brief um, background uh, to me. I'm a project and change management consultant and trainer. I've been in the industry for over 20 years now. I set up Change Quest Limited in 2006 and we became an accredited training organization for the change management practitioner qualification in 2008. That's when it was first launched. I also um, do training in Agile project management and other uh, PRINCE2 qualifications and facilitation as well as uh, being a certified trainer of NLP, that's Neuro Linguistic Programming, and I'm an assessor for the APM qualification as well. My time splits about 50-50 between training and consulting work with clients. And along the way, I also uh, wrote a book called Titanic Lessons in Project Leadership, which, as the name says, looks at the leadership and people aspects um, of the Titanic story. And last year, I was involved in writing the Effective Change Manager uh, Body of Knowledge which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, project management. Here we focus on you know, planning work, delivering work, making sure that we actually deliver something according to time and to budget. You know, and of course, along the way, we're going to talk to our stakeholders, you know, make sure our users are involved so that they know what they're getting. And Mainly, though, the focus is very much on implementing something. But if we don't focus on the change management piece, then what we get is this. What we're lacking is the people side of change. So what we may end up with is a perfectly good system that we've implemented or new processes, but we have people who don't actually want to use what we've delivered. They might pay lip service to it, you know, they might go along with it for a little while, what, what tends to happen is that they revert back to the normal way of doing things. They don't completely buy into that. They don't come along that emotional change journey to really start to own what it is that, you know, is, has been changed. And there are, of course, different types of change. Uh, you know, we can have very small system upgrade, or it might be a change to your computer desktop, or it might be, you know, widen new systems and processes or health and safety procedures, you know, to wider reaching change, like relocating offices or restructuring or deeper culture change within the organization. And these different types of change needs different approaches because you know the sort of work that you're going to have to do where there's a deeper culture change involved is much more involved than if you've got a small you know upgrade to your desktop 
and that's really the type of thing we have to keep in mind because we have to think about what approach is most suitable for what the organization needs right now and for the type of change that we're going with. Are we actually going to be satisfied with having compliance? You know, this is what people need to do. They need to follow these health and safety procedures. And as long as they, you know, it's a checklist and they follow them, we're happy with that. Or are we looking for a deeper mindset change where they fully buy into that? They change their attitude, their beliefs around it as well. So it isn't a case of standing over them with a stick to make sure that it happens. People are completely living and breathing that and it becomes the new way of doing things. Now in, in my career when I, um, I started working with EDS, Electronic Data Systems, and uh, worked for similar types of companies for a long time and was involved in rolling out IT solutions. And we were involved in uh, large-scale global implementations and in those environments we did use a very you know, methodical, traditional waterfall approach to delivering projects. But it was very structured, we were very thorough, we would get users involved, we would uh, do the training for them, we would uh, do the hand-holding, you know, through Go Live and support them through that, and then we'd move on to other projects. And I thought, you know, we were doing a good job. We did involve the users and we did train them, and they were using the system as we left them. But after many years of doing that, I had an opportunity to work with um, a learning and development division at Dell Computer Corporation. They'd called me in to support them with their program of work. Now, this was a completely different environment for me. It was a new world that I hadn't seen before, because here were people who were interested in developing people, developing the capability in the organization, and they were mapping out you know, where people are to where they need to be so that they could meet the strategic goals. And I realized that this was all about change, bringing about that deeper change in the organization. And it's something that was completely new to me. And I could see that actually what this learning and development folk needed was much more project management know-how to help them deliver things more effectively. And the environment that I had come from, which was very much a project program management space, actually what they could do with is becoming much more aware of all this other people stuff that was going on. And that really was a turning point for me because it shaped my thinking about what it is that we need to do to bring about change in organizations. And for me, it's the change management piece that really bridges the gap between those two different worlds. And so why it matters is that the more the change depends on people changing their behavior and attitude, the greater the need for effective change management. We cannot have the same approach to managing change you know, as if we've got a small upgrade to our desktop as we do to if we want culture change or deeper change in the organization. We need to put more emphasis on making sure that people come along with us on that emotional journey. And, you know, we've all experienced change in, in, in our own lives. And you know, maybe at the beginning of the year, you had yourself a goal to get fitter. And perhaps the approach that you were going to use to do that is uh, join a gym. Yep. So you do the research, you find out information, you maybe go visit a couple of gyms and uh, you know, go along, sign up and have your induction program. Great. That's the first bit that's delivered. That's the product management piece. But just because you've done that doesn't mean that you're automatically now going out to the gym, you know, three times a week or whatever it was, and still doing it three months later, four months later, or six months later. Yeah, you might have been very keen the first couple of weeks, and then suddenly 
you know, it maybe becomes a bit more difficult to leave work earlier, to get to the gym, or take time out for it. And very slowly, we can revert back to our old habits. Whereas for real change to occur, not only do we want it to become a habit that we do automatically, it just becomes the normal thing that we do. It becomes who we are. That's really making real transition, real change. And so you can see how in organizations, it takes a lot of effort to actually bring people along that journey in a way that not only do they really engage with that change, but they're prepared to adopt it and stick with it. With the gym um, example, the engaging with it is, you know, you're interested, you want to actively go find out more, do the research, be involved in that part. The adopting it is the actually starting to go and starting to become a habit until that actually sticks so that it really becomes the normal thing of what we do and who we are. So sustaining that and really having that change in bed needs continued focus and continued effort. And that needs to carry on way beyond you know, new systems being implemented. It's what we need to be thinking about from the very beginning of the change program and keep focused on well after implementing the new things as well to make sure that people are supported and able to continue with that. So what are the risks of actually not doing this? Um, you know, when it's poorly managed, people, you know, get stressed by this, there is confusion, there are too many mixed messages going on, morale can be really low, um, that will certainly lead to a drop in productivity, uh, delays in implementation, it can be lots of wasted effort, uh, but basically it means that you know, outcomes are not achieved there is a real failure to adopt these changes and the business benefits aren't realised, which you know, ultimately means that it's very difficult for the organisation to continue to survive. And this quote from Charles Darwin, you know, it says about you know, the strongest of the species, they are the ones who are the most adaptable to change. And that's what organizations need to be able to do. So we're not talking about having yet something else, you know, something different that we need to add on to on top of what we already have. We're talking about organizations who are able to integrate the thinking around change management into their normal day-to-day -day practices. So it becomes the norm for an organization to manage change effectively and deal with change on an ongoing basis. And that's where we need to integrate the project and program management piece, which is absolutely essential to make sure that we can deliver things effectively. But we also need to incorporate that understanding about how do we actually deal with resistance? How do we recognize it? How do we get people motivated for change? and plan for it and how do we then put the right things in place in the organization to be able to sustain that as well. And so th those two areas need to be come together and be integrated in order to get that lasting change in organizations. Now, you know, a lot of this stuff can sound very nice and um, but it can sound a bit intangible, a little bit fluffy in some organizations. Well, here's some research that actually says, look, you know, this is really important. And um, ProSci, Best Practices and Change Management, uh, they, you know, they showed that there is a direct correlation between change management effectiveness and how successful projects are and delivery is in those organizations. Another one, Best Industry Outcomes 2012, says that actually fewer than 20% of organizations 
have change management capability. So, and, and yet there is a direct correlation between not using change management practices effectively and project failure. So it really is an important area that could, because it affects the bottom line. It isn't just something that's nice to have. Here is some more research about what is it that organizations are doing when change goes right. Uh, I'm sure some of these will be very familiar to you. We absolutely need effective sponsorship. We need that support. We need them to be visible. And we need our senior management teams to be aligned and saying the same messages. As well as that direction coming from the top or the messages coming from the top, we need the frontline managers and the managers who are closer to the people on the front line saying the same thing and are bought into the change. So, because people need to hear the messages, not just from up above, but also in a much more localized way, because that's how it's much more meaningful for them. They can, you know, yes, they need to hear the bigger vision from senior leadership uh, to say, yep, we've got the support there behind us, but then that needs to be translated into a much more localized way of what does that actually mean in my division, in my area? What does it actually mean to me? And to help us do that, um, the research shows that we also need an experienced and credible team. We need to have that change management capability and know-how within the organization to help it go smoothly. And with a well-planned approach suited to the type of change, that refers to you know, having the good project program management practices but it needs to be appropriate to the type of change in, in that where there is so much more complexity and uncertainty, it simply isn't you know, possible to plan the whole thing up front in detail like we would have done, say, with the traditional waterfall approaches. Where there is so much more complexity um, and things are unknown, it needs to evolve, so a much more sort of agile approach to managing the change. And of course, you know, the type of change, it depends. If there is a, you know, if we are talking about restructuring, closures, downsizing, of course that's going to have much more of an emotional impact on people. And that needs a different approach to, you know, if we're doing a straightforward system upgrade as well. And of course, along the way, absolutely the continuous and targeted communication. But communication that's you know, relevant for the audience and it's timely and it's you know, pitched at the right level. But clear messages that are consistent, that let people know why we're doing this, the real drivers behind it, what it actually means to them, what they can expect, how they can get involved and using lots of different channels as well, different ways of communicating to people. And change managers help to make this happen. They have an absolutely fundamental role in making sure that this is happening along the way and they're involved in driving it as well. So what is it you know, on a day-to-day -day basis that they can be doing? Uh, they can be involved in getting groups together, you know, making sure that the vision is shared, helping to define that vision, helping to get people ready for change, to be prepared for it, uh, listening to people as well to understand their perspective, their positions, assessing the impact of the change, the wider impact in the organization and how that's going to be managed and of course planning for and implementing those changes. And you know, with such environments, of course, there are going to be many stakeholder relationships to manage. So keeping an eye on those, actively managing them, and understanding what's involved in getting people motivated for change and overcoming that resistance, planning for that, following that through, and 
thinking about how can we reinforce that change to help people adopt it. And also keeping an eye on how do we actually measure the effectiveness of all this action that we're taking and keeping an eye on that as well. So, you know, a fair bit to do for change managers. Now, this is uh, where the change management body of knowledge can actually help us because it outlines what it is that effective change managers need to know. Now, this is published by the Change Management Institute, who are an independent global and professional association, like the APM. They were founded in 2005, and last year they um, partnered with APM Group to um, commission the work for the body of knowledge. Because a professional association, they wanted to have a professional body of knowledge. Because change management now is becoming more of a recognized field. It's still at early days, I would say it's in its adolescence, but it is starting to become recognized that way. And the Change Management Institute wanted to drive that and produce this body of knowledge. So in terms of what the Change Management Institute had done up until now, uh, they have a very wide membership um, with over 600 people across 30 different countries. Back in 2008, they looked into what it is that change management practitioners actually do. So it wasn't about, you know, what is all the good theory out there. This was very much about looking at professional change management people. And they came, they come from all walks of life. You know, they're, they're not just, uh, just from, say, the project and program management sphere. Uh, they may come from the organizational development area, learning and development, so other parts of the organization. That's the thing with change management. People that come to it, they have many diverse backgrounds and come from these different areas. So the research that they undertook wanted to look at what is it that these effective and professional change management people actually do. What skills do they have? What behaviours do they display? And they use that as part of their assessment scheme for certification. So they had that in 2008. In 2012, they also undertook research and developed the organisational change maturity model. So being able to assess where an organisation is in terms of their maturity around change management. And then in 2013, they um, commissioned the work for the effective change manager, a uh, body of knowledge. And really, these are the different angles that are covered. There's, you know, what is it that a practitioner does? That's the competency model. Uh, what is it that an organization does? That's the organizational change maturity model. And then the body of knowledge is addressing what is it that a change practitioner needs to know. So that was really our starting point. That was the remit. We already had their competency model as a, a starting point. So the partnership was set up. And uh, we were commissioned, there were four of us who were, who were um, involved in the authoring team. And the starting point was this competency model. So again, it's not based on theory, it's based on what people actually do. From that, we identified the main themes and proposed a structure for the body of knowledge, which then went out to the membership. Um, it was reviewed, amended, reviewed again. And then based on that structure, we then did some more research about which are the knowledge areas which are important within these key areas. And we went out again to the survey to identify what people considered were key reference sources 
um, applicable to these areas. So the first draft of the Simbok uh, was launched in mid midsummer, about July time. Uh, that went through a thorough review. There were different types of reviews. There was a wide survey, which actually went out to the four CMI membership, again, international audience. And then there was a smaller group who did a deeper review, much more exhaustive. And all that feedback was gathered, things were uh, amended, tweaked, another set of reviews, process, etc., until it was finalized and published in October 2013. And it was launched at the Change Management Conference at that time. Now, just to give you an idea of, of some, some more of thinking behind it, we recognize that people come into change management from that are very, very different backgrounds. So the question then became is, what is the extent of the knowledge areas covering um, that are covered in the body of knowledge? And you know, we talked about, do we narrow it down but go into much more depth? Or do we actually look at the whole breadth of the areas which caters for the fact that people come from these diverse backgrounds? And that was the decision that was made, that it would cover a wide breadth, but we would indicate which areas you know, people need to know more about and more in depth. But the focus with the body of knowledge is very much about saying that this is what change management practitioners need to know. These are the knowledge areas. And here are the references and more reading that you can do to find out more about these areas. And it also links across the different areas to show the relationships. Um, now, the areas that we covered. So, an overall change perspective. So, theories of change management, you know, being able to look at different models, different approaches for different types of change. And how do you actually define change in an organization? So there's that area. Um, thinking about managing benefits. And of course, as you would expect, the stakeholder piece and the communication piece. So that managing stakeholders and managing communication, but it will really engagement as well. And being able to understand the impact of change and how to do um, the assessments around that and being able to assess change readiness in organizations, being able to plan for it, and being able to measure it as well. Uh, and of course, the project management piece comes in, but also these other areas like being aware of education and learning, because a lot of, you know, when you're putting people through change, it's also about how do you develop them and how do you support them. And within this, we've also got facilitation, about being able to facilitate wide groups of people. You know, there will be tensions, there will be disagreements. Um, much of the role is about bringing people together in order to resolve issues and make decisions. And also the sustaining systems, the reinforcing that change. That's a really important area too. What is it that the organization can put in place to help people make that journey and sustain that change so that they don't automatically revert to the normal way of doing things? And that can be at the leadership level, at the organizational level, and also more localized at the teams. And another important area that really had to be included as well was personal and professional management, um, you know, around personal effectiveness, having resilience, uh, being able to manage teams effectively. Leadership is, is in there as well. And other organizational considerations. So actually being aware of the HR function, the organizational development function, um, finance, legal, those other areas. So all of that comes into it as well. So you can see that 
this really is a very wide breadth of, of knowledge areas that have been covered. And of course, it would be very difficult for any one person to be expert in all of those areas. So it's split into, there is a knowledge area. Let's take, for example, the change readiness. That one knowledge area is then divided into further knowledge components because the body of knowledge is saying that for change readiness, these are the different knowledge components which it is useful for a change manager to know. And I've just got two examples here. It says planning for resistance and understanding and knowing about building individual motivation for change. So typically, each knowledge area will have between five and seven knowledge components. And then those are split further again. So for planning for resistance, what are the different knowledge elements within that? So it's understanding what are the causes and types of resistance? What are the different approaches? For, for building individual motivation, there would be other knowledge elements like understanding um, different psychological approaches to motivating people for change. So that's how it's structured. And like I said, it would be very difficult for any one person to be an expert in all of these areas, and we recognize that. So within the book, there's also an indication of you know, which are the areas that, as a change manager, you actually need to know very well and understand fully in depth. So for example, the change impact or the change readiness planning and measurement are certainly areas that change managers should know well and understand in depth to be able to use it. Whereas with this middle bracket, I've got project management and education and learning support here. Now these are areas which change managers do not have to be experts in. Now of course, if a change manager is coming from a project and program management background anyway, they will have that expertise in project and program management. But given that change managers can be coming from a much broader base, from different backgrounds, what it's indicating is that yes, it's very helpful for them to know about project management because obviously we'll be implementing change via project and program management approaches, but they do not need to be an expert in it. Similarly for the education and learning support area, it's certainly very helpful for change managers to understand about training and the different types of interventions that can be put in place and support to help people learn and develop their capability. But they don't need to be an expert in it. They can go to the learning and development division you know, and get support from experts there. Just like um, you know, they could go to the human resources area to get expertise from them, which is the last category. But these are areas that they can have an awareness of so, for example, the legal aspects or more specific human resources, but change managers don't have to be an expert in them. They just have to have enough of an awareness to know that, that this is an area that we may have to you know, consider in more detail for this type of change, so let's get the experts in. So that's how it's um, split between them. Now, why does it matter? This is the first ever attempt at producing a professional body of knowledge for change management. Nothing like this has ever existed before, which is actually why it was such a challenge when we started um, on, on the work last year. It really was a blank piece of paper. Now, where do you go with this? It is such a wide field. Um, and of course, we used the uh, competency framework based on what it is that people actually do. But this is the first ever attempt at it. 
um, and it's published by an independent professional association, so they're not linked to any particular training organization. They are completely independent and they are there to forward the profession of change management. So it really helps with taking a step towards that professionalization of change management. And therefore it gives us a really robust basis for future training, future accreditation. The Change Management Institute are using it as a basis for their assessment criteria for their certification scheme. So you know, it's, it's robust and it's widely recognized and it's something that professionals can be using. But it will continue to develop. I mean, it was version one that was released last year. It's going to be updated again at the end of this year in 2014. And from that point, there will be reviews every two years. So, you know, new additions will keep coming along. But it is based very much on feedback from people out there in the profession. So it's evolving that way. I mean, it was based on, when, as it was being developed, uh, there was feedback that was gathered. And all feedback continues to be welcomed. Uh, there are details in the SIMBOC itself and also on the CMI website where you know, people can continue to give their feedback on this. Now, a body of knowledge gives you, here are the areas that you should know about. It lists those and, and it explains them. It gives definitions and it explains those. But it doesn't go any further. So there has actually all, already been work um, in producing a what we're affectionately calling now the book of the book, which essentially will be the Effective Change Manager's Handbook. And this will actually go into detail for each of the areas and describe how do you actually do this in practice. So it's very much a practitioner's handbook. Um, and actually, just as of yesterday, we um, uh, delivered the version to Coke and Page, who are the publishers. There have been 17 authors involved in this work, so you can imagine there's been quite a lot of liaising and, and um, you know, having to compile things, put things together. But that's gone off to Coke and Page, and it's due to be published later on in this, uh, this year, in November 2014. And that's when the second version of the body of knowledge will be uh, launched as well. Uh, it will just be updated to reflect the feedback that's been gathered so far. There won't be any major structural changes to it. The knowledge areas won't be changing. Um, it, it's more smaller tweaks. So it is an ongoing continuing resource that people can use. And the body of knowledge is available from Amazon. So how can it actually help individuals? Uh, it can be a basis for self-assessment. So, you know, the change managers can tip in and out of it. I must admit, since I've had it, it I, I've worked with clients, and when I'm out there with clients, it's something that we are dipping into constantly. I have a very well-thumbed copy. It's a useful structure for continuous professional development as well. And it also gives the further reading guide you know, in the areas that you may not be so familiar with. It points you in the right direction. And it um, obviously is a, a useful way to set the accreditation schemes, which CMI are using. And this is also uh, what will be used for future uh, change management practitioner qualifications uh, from the APM group as well, which will be from next year. So obviously how it, with organizations, it can help with recruitment of uh, uh, recruiting change professionals. It can help with structuring internal education programs. It can help with selecting you know, the right sorts of consultants. And basically, it acts as a really good checklist. We intentionally stayed away from being too prescriptive 
about saying that this is a method that you should follow for change management because there really is no one set way that you can manage all the different types of change that are out there. But what it does have is a natural flow. You know, it starts off with defining change. You need to think about how do you plan for it, how do you get ready for it, uh, and then it moves towards how do you sustain it. So there is a natural flow that you would expect through a change life cycle, but it is not prescriptive about any set methods. So, but it's still a useful checklist for saying, that, have we thought about this, or have we covered that off? Right, I've got several questions here. What do you suggest be the first steps of action in changing behaviours of an organisation as a whole from reactive to proactive and more project-based rather than business as usual? With this type of thing where it really is about, it, you know, it's the attitude, moving from reactive to proactive, you can't do that in a day. Uh, there aren't any magic answers to it, I'm afraid, either. But the very first step in something like this has got to be about raising awareness. Raising awareness about what is going on. Raising awareness about what are the results that we are getting as a result of being in this reactive mode. So really making that visible, making that very transparent, and getting people to become more aware of what is it that's happening and what are the consequences of that happening. From that awareness point, you can then start to move towards, uh, okay, so we need to do something about this and what is it, what are the things that we can start to do, start to do and taking very small steps. How important do you see domain knowledge with respect to the change management role and organisational change? Domain. That is, how necessary is domain knowledge? Yeah. Um, my, I, I believe that it's important to focus on how do we um, manage people and support people through change. So I don't believe it is essential to have the domain knowledge. What it is essential to be able to do though is know who the right people are to go talk to, to understand the areas and understand the risks that are involved. And if you don't have the domain knowledge, you won't automatically be able to appreciate some of the risks that are involved. So I don't believe you have to have the domain knowledge, but I feel it's very important to know who to go talk to and be very proactive about that. Uh, what change management qualifications exist in order to demonstrate competence, examinations, public, vocational, etc. Sure. Um, I mean, there are, it's a good point about the examinations. Um, I mean, there are, there is the change management practitioner qualification by the APM group, which is examined at two different levels, foundation and practitioner. There are, uh, I, I believe CIPD have a, a shorter two-day course in change management. But the Change Management Institute takes it a step further, so it moves beyond examining people you know, via exams. What they're wanting to do is assess behaviours, so assess competence through um, demonstration of you know, what it is that people are doing. So that, that's a scheme that the Change Management Institute have. Those are, those are just some that I can think of. I mean, there aren't a lot of qualifications out there, um, but, but there are some, you know, it's growing. What is the best way to target and influence cultural change when you exist as a small team within a large organisation? Is it top-down? You know, do we really need to have a top-down approach or can we start bottom-up? Um, and I become... Um, over in, in recent years, actually, I've um, become quite a fan of emergent change or, or 
you know, small changes, step by step approach, uh, demonstrating, you know, on, on a small scale, demonstrating the impact of that and the effect of that, and then letting it spread. Um, that's certainly one way that you can bring about change. I also recognize, though, that really when you're talking about something like deeper culture change which is organization wide then you really do need it the buy-in from the top and for it to come from the top as well um, so you really need a, a combined approach absolutely do this at the team level really focus on demonstrating the changes that you want to encourage talking about them, you know, um, creating stories around them, making sure that those stories spread uh, so that people can actually start to see the benefit and start to become interested because of the results that you're getting. So spread the word that way and at the same time keep pushing it upwards to get the very higher level support so that it can be spread quicker across the organisation. Do you need to demonstrate competence in order to join the CMI? Um, um, actually, no, not at all. Um, you can um, uh, join. They have different levels. You can uh, join without um, having demonstrated anything. They have a foundational level, sort of entry level. You, the competence uh, bit only comes in at the higher level if you want to become a certified you know, professional change manager. What ideas do you have to prepare an organisation for any future change rather than a specific change associated with each individual project? It's a very, very good point about, you know, we need to be prepared constantly, you know, thinking ahead, not just react, being in firefighting mode and reacting when it hits us. And so the idea of uh, you know, around the thinking about what is involved in actually getting ready for change. So making people aware of just how much is involved, that it isn't just about planning the delivery and delivering it, that it starts before that, where it's about, you know, have we got the right communication mechanisms in place? Have we got, would we be able to get a, you know, the, the, the right governance in place who are able to formulate very, very clear vision around change when we needed them to. Are we able to um, have the right mechanisms in place to think about how we would sustain it? So it's really, uh, it, it's about building, making them aware of how much it is that they need to know and what they will need to do early while there is still time for them to get to grips with it and start to get ready for it. Do you feel there is considerable overlap with portfolio management, especially in the benefits arena? Hence my question is, do I really need to buy another book that may repeat much of the elements in benefits and portfolio arena? Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, you, I mean, there are, you know, we've got program management, we've got portfolio management, we've got the benefit side, we've got the change side, we've got leadership things, um, and, and it is useful to know about all of those areas. What I would say, I mean, absolutely the benefits, um, managing the benefits is really useful, as is understanding how to manage portfolios and programs. What I would say is, the things around um, the psychological approaches to motivating people, um, you know, helping them, support, supporting them through change, it's those areas which uh, if you feel that there is a gap, it would be worth you looking into those areas, that side of it. So not so much the benefits of the delivery focus, but more around the you know, motivating individuals and the understanding the sources of resistance and approaches for overcoming that resistance, I feel would be a real valuable addition 
if you are interested in uh, finding out more about change, don't forget that there is the APM Enabling Change uh, SIG as well that you can join up for. And as Colin said earlier, it's www.notforward.com.